morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so lovely to see you all here, and it's lovely to see all of the beautiful decorations that everybody came to do. Um, I'm thankful to be here after not feeling well last week, so um, it's just wonderful to see all the beautiful poinsettias that are arriving, and please feel free. We can always have more. There's never too many of those up here, in my opinion. So, um, this is a couple of announcements this morning. Um, you know that the items for the giving tree need to be here by today. They're going to be doing the wrapping party on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. They're gonna have like a little soup lunch, if I recall correctly, and have a little wrapping party. So if you would like to join them to do that, you are welcome. That will be here at church. Another little reminder to um, check your mailboxes because our fellowship hall is open and we are putting things in your mailboxes. So be sure and go and check those, see if there's anything in there. If you don't have one, let Robbie know. She will get one put up for you, okay? Now, a big thank you to Jennifer Mock who put on a really great, from what I hear, youth a Christmas party yesterday, which was very well attended. Is that right? Very yes. well attended and, and fun to have that all. Thank you, Jennifer, for coordinating all of that and for all you kids that came. That's a, an awesome. Um, and then a reminder for next Sunday, we are having a Remembrance Sunday. And following the Remembrance Sunday, we're going to have a potluck. There is not a sign up. But if you just bring a main dish salad or a dessert and join us afterwards um, for some fellowship time and some good food. There's always good food at a Lutheran potluck, so you need to come. Um, I think that is all I have, other than just a reminder, we have our December, our Christmas Eve service um, at 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Um, any other announcements that any might have? Good. All right. Uh, Janet? Yeah. Next Sunday morning, the children, so that's everybody from Susie through high school, needs to be here no later than 9 15. We're going to be in the sanctuary and run through our Christmas program. Remember, the grown ups are doing all the singing and the kids are being adorable. <laughs> okay. So, all the kids here by 9 15 downstairs next Sunday. Okay. Right oh, up here, sorry, up here at 9.15 next Sunday, they're looking adorable, we're singing. That's the gist of that message. All right, that's all I have. Well, welcome here to Grace Lutheran Church on our almost Christmas service. Um, one thing that you will notice that this was brought to my attention, not, la not this week, but last week, I just forgot about it. You will notice that we do not sing the Gloria in Excelsis, uh, which, appear, which appears right after, I can almost see this, just a second, here I go. Uh, just after the Alleluia, no, isn't it? Just after the Alleluia. Now, the sad thing is, I don't know how many hundreds of times I have sung this song and done this liturgy, but I tend to forget about it. But in any case, you will notice that we don't sing the glory in Excelsis, and that is because it is skipped during the Advent season, because it, when we don't sing that, we miss it, and therefore we look forward to Christmas when we'll sing it again, because that's when the Christ child comes. So there is a reason it is missing in our liturgy. We're not just being forgetful. That being said, let's start off with our children's message. Wait, wait, actually, before we do that, let's start off with our Advent candle lighting, which has already been lit, but we do get to sing the verses.
Okay, now we'll do the children's message, and look, I actually remembered to bring it this time. Okay, so the children can come up, and we'll do our children's message. and then we'll do our science experiment. So, the last time we talked, I think we talked about King David, but I'm not entirely sure. But in any case, this takes place when Israel was still a country, but at this time Israel, they were not being very obedient to God. And so God sent some enemies to fight against them. And the enemies they were facing this time were called the Ninevites. And the Ninevites were horrible, horrible people. They go to Israel, they beat them up, they take their, they take their stuff, and they would treat them really, really badly. Well, God came to Israel. He came to a man named, uh, I can almost say this, Jonah. And he said, Jonah, I need you to go to the Ninevites. I need you to tell them to stop doing bad things and to turn to me. Because if they aren't going to do that, I'm going to destroy them. Well, Jonah heard that and he thought, no way am I going to go to the Ninevites. They're our enemies. I hate them. And so Jonah got to a boat and he sailed away in the opposite direction of the Ninevites. He was going to run away. Well, Jonah and all the other people in the boat were going, and then a storm came up, and the boat started to rock. And the storm got worse and worse and worse, and everyone in the boat was scared they were all going to drown. Well, they finally figured out that someone in that boat was disobeying God. And then they figured out it was Jonah. And, they, and Jonah said, okay, it's me. Just take me and throw me over the side of the boat into the water and you'll be safe. But the people in the boat said, no, 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 Jonah. We're going to try to save you. We're going to try to get away. And so they rowed as hard as they could. But the storm got worse and worse and worse. And finally they found out we're not going to be able to escape this. And so they took Jonah and they threw him out of the boat. And splash, he went into the water. And as soon as he hit the water, a great big fish went boom. And it swallowed up Jonah. And there was Jonah in the belly of the great big fish. And that's when he finally figured it out. He said, God, I'm sorry I tried to run away from you. I'm sorry that I did that. I'm going to obey you. I promise you I will go to Nineveh just like you told me. And so God had the great big fish swim up near land. And it went, Plush! and it spit up Jonah right in the ground. And then Jonah got up and he went right to Nineveh. And when he got there, he said, okay, everybody listen to me. Everybody here, turn to God. Stop doing evil things. Start doing good things or God is going to destroy everybody here. Well, the people heard that. Even the king of Nineveh heard that. And every single person from the king down to the littlest person got down on their hands and knees and they prayed. They said, God, we're sorry we disobeyed you. We're going to turn to you. We're going to do the right thing. Just please don't destroy us. And God listened, and he didn't destroy anybody there. But when Jonah saw that, he was mad because he didn't like the Ninevites. And he went outside of the town, and he was just stomping around being angry. And he said, God, I am so mad you saved these people. And God said, but they turned to me. They asked for forgiveness, and I forgave them. That's what I do. What would you want me to do? And that's actually the end of the story. And one of the things this shows us is that God wants us to love and be nice to everybody, even people that are mean to us. And that is a really hard thing for us to do, but God told us to love everybody, and he will help us love everybody. All right, so we're going to try our science experiment here. So here we go, and sorry, none of you get to see this, but there you go. All right, do you want to be my helper? Okay, so see, not that you can see this, but here we have Jonah. All right, so take Jonah, and you're going to put him right in the middle there. So put him right there, and we'll see what happens to Jonah. See? Jonah's getting swallowed up. So here it comes. We can still see a little bit of Jonah. There we go. Oh, he's almost gone. Not yet. We can still see Jonah's head right there. Oh, here it comes. A teeny bit left. A teeny bit left. There's a bunch of slime coming up and over Jonah right now. And you can see this after the service. I can show this to all the adults. Although, just a teeny bit left. Ah, oh, Jonah got all swallowed up. So, there's our science. Okay, so, let's pray. 
Oh, God, thank you so much for this story about Jonah, and help us to love people. Help us to do what you said, like Jonah eventually did, but mostly just help us to love everybody, even the people that are mean to us. We know we can't do that on our own, so please help us do it. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. All right. You all can go downstairs for the other stuff. I dig Jonah out. <laughs> Okay, now please rise for a confession and absolution. Actually, what I meant to say was please stay seated for our hymn. I was just testing you. rise for our confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father. 
beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. In the stead by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. against you, 
He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And he will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in, at, that, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. or shall we look for another? And when the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go, tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. 
When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by a wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who are dressed in splendid clothing and live in luxury are in the king's courts. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is of he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger out before your face, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet he, yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And now please join with me as I confess our, we confess our common faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. something that most everyone else takes for granted. Take this. When I was little, I watched a lot of cartoons. Now, I knew cartoons weren't real. I know if you bump someone on the head with a frying pan, they don't get up a little while later with nothing wrong with them other than a few stars twirkling around their head. In other words, I never hit anyone with a frying pan. However, there was something that happened to cartoons for time to time that honestly left me in doubt. Let's see if I'm the only one. So, in cartoons, what happens if someone takes a big sniff of pepper? There we go, yes, they sneeze. Well, 
they, so my young self, however, decided to check out and see, is that really true? Do people really sneeze when they take a big sniff of pepper? So I got my little pepper shaker, took off the top, put my little nose right over it, plugged one nostril, and breathed in deeply. Well, for those of you in doubt, pepper does not make you sneeze. It does, however, cause a great deal of choking and discomfort. <laughs> now, there we go. Now, none of you ever have to go and breathe in pepper. Not that any of you out there would be so, well, let's say the word unwise. So, we solved the pepper thing. But what about a more complicated question? Like, is sin a doubt? What we read about John from Luke's Gospel this morning would seem to show us that John indeed doubted. But was that doubt a sin? Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So there we're told we must have faith and we must believe in God, and yet doubt would seem to be the opposite of both of those. But nevertheless, even if doubt is a sin, it is not an unforgivable sin. We know that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin which would necessarily include doubt, if it is a sin. Because there are some people, and I mean authentically born-again believers in God, that maintain that doubt is not always a sin. R.C. Sproul says, An all-important difference exists, therefore, between the open-minded uncertainty of doubt and the closed-minded certainty of unbelief. So, what he seemed to mean is that doubt is not necessarily a sin because doubt is not the final decision. Doubt is more something we have to experience on our way to making the final decision. But I suppose we could ask ourselves yet another question. So right now we're thinking about, is doubt a sin? But here's a way maybe to clarify it. Did Jesus ever doubt? If he did, then we know that it was not a sin. So we know that Jesus was tempted. The devil asked Jesus multiple times, if you are the Son of God. And while Jesus was certainly tempted by Satan's easier and less painful way, I don't think we could say that Jesus ever doubted that he was the Son of God. And likewise, when Jesus was suffering in the garden the night before he would be crucified, he prayed to the Father that the torch that he might avoid that torturous death that lay before him. But I don't think that Jesus ever doubted that he was going to die on the cross because that was always the Father's plan. So I don't think we can actually say that Jesus ever doubted. But still, what about us? Is doubt a sin? Or possibly is it sometimes a sin and sometimes not a sin? Well, let's turn to Luke's Gospel and see if we can find some answers. Our account starts off with the disciples of John coming to John and telling him about the things that Jesus had done. Specifically, they were probably telling him about the two miracles that Jesus had just performed. First, Jesus healed a centurion servant, even though that servant was far away from Jesus, far away from Jesus merely by declaring him to be healed. And second, Jesus had just raised a widow's son from the dead. Now that particular miracle made the people fear and glorify Jesus as well as recognize him as a great prophet. But John's reaction to those two accounts is curious. John doubted who Jesus was. Now remember, John was there. He was when Jesus was baptized. He saw the Holy Spirit descend in the form of a dove onto Jesus, and he heard God the Father speak directly from heaven, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. And at the time, John himself said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So how could John doubt all that he saw and heard and even confess with his own mouth? Because it seems unmistakable that John did doubt. He told his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, interestingly, not too long before, John himself answered a similar question, because the people came up to him and wondered if he was the Christ. But John said that he definitely wasn't, but that the Christ was coming. And it quickly became obvious that John was speaking of Jesus. So 
What happened to John to have, cause him to go from boldly proclaiming God's truth to doubting it? Well, some believe that John wasn't so much doubting as he was seeking confirmation of what he already knew to be true. But I don't know about that. John had already come to a definitive decision on just who Jesus was. Well, and this following is speculation, so take it as such. Perhaps John doubted because he was undergoing intense persecution at that point in time. He was in prison, and his future was looking pretty grim because the queen wanted him dead. So maybe John was under the assumption that while he knew he was going to face some opposition for following Jesus, dying in prison just seemed to be too much. Maybe John was wondering if God was really with him given the tribulation that he was going through. And I don't think we here are that much different than John. Now, sure, we expect to suffer for Jesus, but sometimes I think we're tempted to think, isn't there a limit? But I don't think the Bible offers any limits. Look at Paul. He was lashed five times, beaten with rod three times, and stoned once. And look at Jesus. He was scourged and crucified. So it doesn't seem like we have any right to doubt God, no matter what he puts us through. But still, is that doubt a sin? Well, let's keep reading. So John's disciples come to Jesus, and they ask him John's question. And Jesus had two responses. First, he healed people, and he cast out evil spirits. Now, other people had done those things before, but nobody performed miracles as often as Jesus and also, when those other prophets performed miracles of healing, they prayed to God for those things to come to pass. But Jesus, he just declared people to be healed. And so the divine nature of Jesus could not be rightly or logically doubted. The men sent by John had personally witnessed the truth through the works of Jesus. But Jesus had yet more to say. He said that all of his miraculous healings were proof of who he was. He said that he had come to preach good news to the poor. Now, that's something that Jesus had said earlier as one of his first public teachings in his hometown when he read the words of Isaiah. The poor that Jesus is referring to here could be understood in two ways. I would say both of them could be true. First, Jesus could have meant the poor in terms of those that had little to nothing in terms of monetary, of material wealth. He could have said that he was coming to those people because for the most part, the Jewish leaders didn't have anything to do with the poor because they thought them to be unimportant and unworthy of their time. But Jesus also could have been speaking of these poor as those that were poor in spirit, those people that knew they didn't have anything to offer God, those people that knew they could do nothing but rely on the grace and mercy of their Lord. And Jesus also said something else. He said, blessed are those who are not offended by me. Well, what did Jesus mean by that? Earlier, Jesus, there was another time that Jesus spoke of a, of a situation similar to what John was going through. He said that there are people that hear the gospel and immediately receive it with joy, but they do not have a root in themselves, and they endure for a little while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the world, they on account of the word, they immediately fall away. In other words, it looks like it is a sin to be offended or to doubt if it is right for Jesus to put us through whatever suffering he decides to put us through. Although, again, like we're going to see, that is not an unforgivable sin. Now, note that the, talk, the suffering that I'm talking about here is not the suffering that we bring on ourselves through our own sinful behavior, but the suffering that comes upon us by the will of God through no fault of our own. But I also think that the, uh, I think that the offense that Jesus was speaking of could be of a different type. Although I would say this still related to doubt. It is being offended by something that Jesus said or did instead of meditating on his proven, gracious, loving, and all-knowing nature. It is relying on our own understanding and assuming that we're right and it's Jesus the one that is wrong. Now, this is something that happened frequently to Jesus. For example, when Jesus was preaching those, was Jesus was originally preaching about preaching good news to the poor in his hometown, he also spoke well of the Gentiles, and the people hearing him took great offense to that. 
They didn't seem to think it was possible that Jesus' understanding of Gentiles was the right one, and they were in the wrong. And again, this frequently happens in our day. The Bible says any number of things that offends people. In fact, I don't think anyone could find I don't think anyone can find fail to find something in the Bible that they don't find offensive. And at that point, everyone has a choice: God or themselves. And it looks like that is what that, that is the choice that Jesus left John's disciples with: Jesus or themselves. And after that, they returned to John. But Jesus kept on teaching when they left. After what looks like a rebuke of John's unwarranted doubt, Jesus went on to speak very well of John. Jesus said that John was strong and unyielding, and he said that John had avoided the conventional, easier means of power. Jesus even said that John was a prophet. And maybe, and I would say most importantly, Jesus never condemned John for his doubt even if Jesus did rebuke him for it. And that makes sense. As is written in Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Even though John doubted, there was no doubt that John had faith in Jesus, even unto death. Something similar happened to Thomas. Thomas doubted and he refused to believe that Jesus was resurrected until Jesus was standing right there before him in the flesh. And so Jesus came to John, all for and so Jesus came to Thomas, all for Thomas owns benefit, just so that Thomas would believe in him. But at the same time, Jesus rebuked Thomas. He said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. And after that encounter, Thomas went on to believe in Jesus to the end. Thomas died a martyr. According to church tradition and history, Thomas died in India at the hands of the Hindu priests of Kali. So we can see that the doubt of John led to something good, a strength in faith. But that, and that leaves some people to conclude that that means doubt itself is not a sin. But I'm not sure if that's a justified conclusion. Many things can lead us to good, that is, a stronger relationship with our Lord. But that doesn't mean everything that we go through itself that results in that closer and that stronger faith itself is good. For example, many of us here have gone through tragedies that drew us closer to Jesus, but that doesn't make those tragedies good. But perhaps, though, there's yet a different kind of the doubt that John seemed to have seemed to arise from weakness and maybe even fear. But there are also doubts that come from a lack of knowledge. Some people doubt God because they just don't know very much about him. For example, many people think God is a cruel judge that just waits for people to mess up so he can cast them into hell. And those people have a hard time understanding how that kind of God could be a God of love. You know what? They're right. That kind of God would not be a God of love. But the God that we believe in, the God of the Bible, is a God that loves us so much that he became one of us. He is a God that died just so that we can live with him forever. He is a God that saved us just so that we can live in a perfectly restored relationship with him forever. And also, he's a God that wants us, us flawed, doubting humans, to be his workers so that more and more people can believe in him by us telling other people about him. Those kind of doubts, doubts based on an honest misunderstanding, are the kind, are the kind that can be answered. You see, we don't believe in Jesus despite the evidence. We believe in Jesus because of the evidence. The evidence of the historical accounts in the Bible. The evidence of good and evil in the world the evidence of God working in our own lives. Or, as one writer put it, faith doesn't mean screwing up our stomach muscles and deciding to step out boldly in the dark. Faith is more like opening our eyes to the dazzling light that is before us. Still, are we going to doubt? Absolutely. The Bible is filled with doubters. Look at Moses. Moses doubted that Pharaoh or his own people would listen to him and do the things that God commanded him to do. But God answered all of those doubts. And Moses went on to be one of the greatest men of faith the world will ever know. 
But still, exploring our doubts is never going to be an easy thing. To begin with, it takes faith in the grace of Jesus because we must believe that God is not going to cast us off for doubting any more than he did so for John. But also, it means we have to be honest with ourselves, and that also is not an easy thing to do. While admitting that we are sinners was hard enough, I think admitting that we're doubters might even be harder because it doesn't make us look like the children of God that we know we're supposed to be. And then there's the hard work that, to do in exploring our doubts. It means that we're going to have to read the Bible and maybe even other sources all the more. It means we might have to go to another person and admit that we need their help. And of course, it means we're going to have to pray all the more too. We pray like we're told in James 1, 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting that the one who, the, who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. It's a strange thing. We have to pray to the very God that we're doubting that God himself will help us overcome our doubts in him. Again, doing this takes courage. We must trust the word of God is true when it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now, so far we've been talking about uh, our own doubts. But what about the doubts of others? Well, we do basically what Jesus did. We answered their doubts and we never cast them away. Like it says in Jude 22, have mercy on those who doubt. So even if doubt is a sin, we don't condemn people for having doubts because we're not their judges. And in the same way, we do not condemn ourselves when we have doubts. So, my beloved, I leave you with this. Confess your doubts to God and turn to his word. Now, may the peace of Jesus, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, please rise, and we're going to do the offertory a cappella, because our musician is downstairs helping our children. Yeah, and that never mind.
Please rise for the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, look with compassion upon your people whenever they suffer for the name of Jesus. Give them wisdom when they are presumed to compromise, pressure to compromise, provide when they suffer loss, give courage when they are afraid, and strengthen them in the midst of persecution until you deliver them. Preserve them always in the joyful hope that all that you will restore all that is lost with what cannot be taken away. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O giver of all good gifts, look upon the household of your people. Provide companionship for those who are alone. Strengthen the bonds of marriage and equip parents to raise children in love and faith. Grant that our homes may be places of joy, reasonableness, peace, and prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you set the prisoners free. Remember those who are incarcerated justly and grant that they might repent, be freed from the clutches of sin, accept the consequence of their wrongdoing, and learn to live honestly and peacefully. Remember all those who are in prison unjustly. Restore their freedom according to your will and preserve them in your grace and the confidence that you know what is true and just. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son became flesh and healed the sick of all kinds of diseases and afflictions, demonstrating his power and giving us a foretaste of the resurrection of the last day. Have mercy upon all those in need of deliverance. Heal them in your time and according to your will, and preserve them in the confidence that you will deliver your people from all afflictions and the resurrections of all flesh. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we lift up Bill Coblin to you. We pray that you make him well and drive all the sickness from his body. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Linda's neighbor, Annette, who has cancer. We pray for a miraculous healing, but if not that, wisdom and skill from the doctors, and above all else, peace with her and what she is going through. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue to lift up Pam soft to you. We pray that her treatments go well. We pray that she does not suffer any lasting complications of this. And we just pray that you strengthen their, both Pam and Phil's faith in you and help them to just lean on you in all these things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for Linda's Aunt Jane that passed away this week. Please give her children and her family peace during this time and help them turn to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Judy, Faye, Judy Hayes, who is undergoing a foot surgery. We pray for a swift healing that she may, be, she may come back and be with us soon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all the tornado victims, both the ones that have killed and the ones that have lost so many things. We pray for peace for them. We pray that the ones who did lose anything can have their material possessions restored. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And we pray for Ellen's sister and brother-in-law who have both died from the children, leaving the three children that Ellen is going to be a guardian of, and she's going to be moving to Tennessee. Oh, Lord Jesus, please help that move go swiftly and easily, and please help those children as they transition to a new guardian just to feel loved, and please help her to have patience during all of this. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord Jesus, we pray for all of our shut-ins that have not yet been able to join us. We pray that they are still hearing the word of God and they are uplifted and strengthened by it. And please help us who are here to go and visit and uplift those people by your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for Floyd's knee replacement surgery on the 22nd, please give skill for the doctor. We pray that it goes perfectly well and that knee never bothers him again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray thanksgiving for Doug and Chantel's engagement yesterday. Amen to that, Jesus. May they have a marriage that leans on you in all possible ways. Lord, your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Jesus, thank you for healing baby Susie. She's back to her regular self. Thank you for that. Lord, your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend for whom all we pray. Trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we turn now to the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You have seated, we'll sing our final hymn. make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Well, thank you for coming. We have snacks in the back and we hope you join us there. And if anyone wants to see the science thing, I'll set that up too. <laughs>